Jim Ziegler here for Brainwaves, and I'd like to start off our program this week with the poem, Sick, by Shel Silverstein. I cannot go to school today, said little Peggy Ann McKay. I have the measles and the mumps, a gash, a rash, and purple bumps. My mouth is wet, my throat is dry, I'm going blind in my right eye. My tonsils are as big as rocks, I've counted sixteen chicken pox. And there's one more, that's seventeen. And don't you think my face looks green? My leg is cut, my eyes are blue. It might be the instamatic flu. I cough and sneeze and gasp and choke. I'm sure that my left leg is broke. My hip hurts when I move my chin, my belly button's caving in. My back is wrenched, my ankle's sprained. My appendix pains each time it rains. My toes are cold, my toes are numb. I have a sliver in my thumb. My neck is stiff, my voice is weak. I hardly whisper when I speak. My tongue is filling up my mouth, I think my hair is falling out. My elbow's bent, my spine ain't straight, my temperature is 108. My brain is shrunk, I cannot hear, there's a hole inside my ear. I have a hangnail and my heart is, what, what's that? What's that you say? You say today is Saturday? Goodbye, I'm going out to play. Shel Silverstein was a 20th century renaissance man a poet, a cartoonist, a recording artist, and through his playful words, he taught generations of young adults through his sense of humor. Growing up, I'm sure we all remember times when we felt sick, or we couldn't go to school, we didn't feel like going to summer camp, or just wanted to stay in bed. We always had some excuse. My head hurts. My belly aches. I have a cough. We were kids. That's what we're supposed to say. But what if we truly believed it? That by knowing deep inside yourself that something was wrong to the point of actually manifesting symptoms, or through your behavior you convinced others that you were ill, when in fact that there was no actual biologic basis for your sickness. But you've seen this before as well. Hypochondriacs, or people who suffer from some sort of internal delusion, a factitious disorder. There's nothing organically wrong with them, but their mind has made it so. In today's episode of the Brainwaves Podcast, we take this one step further. Instead of believing yourself to be ill, with fever or headache or back pain, you had no pains at all. These are the complaints of the living. What if you believed yourself to be dead? This episode was brought to you in part by Audible, your source for audiobooks. With nearly 200,000 titles to choose from at the click of a button, Audible makes it easy to find time to catch up on stories. If you like this episode so far, then we know you will like The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and Other Clinical Tales by Oliver Sacks. You can get this audiobook and others like it for a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. That's audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. It's not an unheard of concept, actually, being alive and yet believing oneself to be dead, or at least to believe that you lack the organs that are necessary to maintain life. It was described a century and a half ago in France, and a handful of cases have continued to surface over the years. The true incidence of this delusion is hard to determine, and it's hard to distinguish malingering from factitious disorders and other delusional conditions. And not all the time are these beliefs of personal death permanent, If they do persist, at least we've got 21st century medicine and technology that can be used to improve the quality of these patients' lives, and even correct the delusions sometimes. But that wasn't always the case. In today's show, we're going to go back in time to when there wasn't an available treatment for this condition, to when it was first described. And you might say that it's equally puzzling now as it was back then. Jules Cotard was born on June 1, 1840, in a small town called Issoudun, 150 miles south of Paris. He was the son of a printer and a bookseller, who owned a substantial library that would come to shape his son's early education. Growing up, Jules Cotard was known to be serious and reflective, a young boy who took advantage of his father's extensive library, and he would return home during breaks from school to enjoy these collected works. Eventually, his passions for philosophy and the sciences rose above all others, no doubt fueled by a friendship he developed with Auguste Comte, 
a French philosopher known for his work on positivism, which is less of an optimistic frame of mind and more of a state of enlightened thought, where one identifies and accepts nature's laws and empirical evidence over the abstract forces and theology. Jules Cotard took what he learned from his father's library and his friendship with Comte and was appointed as an intern in neurology at La Salpetriere under Jean-Marie Charcot and Edmé Félix Alfred Vulpian. He excelled under Charcot and Vulpian's mentorships, and four years later, Cotard would receive the prize for medicine and surgery of the prestigious French association known as the Société de Biologie. Charcot, who was known for his anatomical clinical method of teaching, impressed upon Cotard the importance of the clinico-pathologic correlation. Many neurology residency programs to this day, including the University of Pennsylvania and the Partners Program in Boston, still incorporate this educational strategy, almost two centuries later. And Cotard took this instruction to heart. Performing a number of autopsies on his own time, he became one of the world's youngest experts on brain atrophy, and in particular the pathology which underlies cerebral infarction. Through Charcot's instruction on the clinical pathologic correlation, and the need for physicians to follow their patients over time and even through autopsy, Jules Cotard compared histologic specimens of patients with brain damage that was acquired later in life, via stroke, for example, or during infancy. He astutely remarked that, quote, intelligence may be normal when a hemisphere is destroyed during infancy, in these cases, one never encounters aphasia. Through these observations, and in his efforts to rehabilitate patients who suffered from stroke, he was the first physician to propose that the functions of one cerebral hemisphere might eventually take over the lost functions of another. Equally impressive were his pursuits in the field of neuropsychiatry. Among his more famous works, Cotard was one of the first to describe an association between diabetic hyperglycemia and altered mentation, including acute psychosis. And he was extremely interested in psychoses, particularly delusions, functional symptoms, and hypochondriasis, one of the delusional misidentification syndromes, as they're sometimes referred to. And here we get to the famous delusion which bears Cotard's name, also known as the Delire de Negations. You've probably seen or at least heard of the 1999 film by M. Night Shyamalan, The Sixth Sense. In this American thriller, pale-faced Haley Joel Osment suffers from a very clearly psychotic disorder. He sees dead people. I see dead people. In your dreams? While you're awake? In the film, the child psychologist Malcolm Crowe, who's played by Bruce Willis, meets Osmond and attempts to console him through these disturbing delusions. Walking around like regular people. We don't see each other. They only see what they want to see. Only later to discover that Osmond can only see and interact with Willis because Willis himself is dead. How it takes Bruce Willis this long to figure it out is beyond me. And here's a little trivia for you in case you wanted to know. Remember that red door that Willis gets to at the end of the movie? I actually lived in that building for two years. Didn't see any ghosts, though. Anyhow, there's not a disease name to my knowledge which specifically refers to a dead person who thinks he's alive, the delusional disorder suffered by Willis's character, that makes no sense at all. In contrast, the Cotard delusion is the opposite. In this state of mind, the patient, who's alive, believes he or she is in fact dead. In some cases of the Cotard delusion, the patient may not think themselves to be dead, but that they may be missing some vital organs, or that they could even exist outside their body. Cotard first described this delusion during a lecture given in Paris in 1880. The patient, who is known as Mademoiselle X, was a 43-year-old woman who knew herself to lack certain vital body parts. Quote, no brain, no nerves, no chest, no stomach, only skin and bones of a decomposing body. As such, she no longer needed to eat, and as you might have guessed, the young woman later died due to complications of starvation. While it was originally described as a psychotic depression, or the Delir de Negations, eventually the eponym Cotard Delusion was commemorated in 1887. Among its other names are the Walking Corpse Syndrome, which would nicely fit Mademoiselle X's chief complaint, and it's not characterized as such under the current DSM-5. Instead, it's loosely characterized under the umbrella term of a somatic delusion. 
As in most neuropsychiatric syndromes, the Cotard delusion can occur as a consequence of a variety of brain injuries. Structural disorders such as primary brain tumors, cerebral infarctions, demyelinating disease, and traumatic brain injury have all been reported with the walking corpse syndrome. Often, there's neuroimaging evidence of brain injury. Frequently frontal, it's bilateral, or can be non-dominant parietal. Neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson disease and idiopathic conditions like migraines and temporal lobe epilepsy have been associated with this condition, and there may not be any neuroimaging or EEG abnormalities here. In one of the largest retrospective cohorts to date, Sahu and Josephs recently described 12 adults with Qatar delusions due to various causes. Notably, eight of these patients had significant psychiatric history, including prior diagnoses of depression, schizophrenia, or polysubstance abuse. One patient presented with Capgras syndrome as well. He felt as if his wife were an alien. Luckily, for most reported cases, treatment has been effective these days. Typically, patients are treated for their underlying medical condition, like preventing future migraines, discontinuing any offending illicit substances, or alleviating depressive symptoms. Other patients have responded to antipsychotics, anticonvulsants, and in rare cases, electroconvulsive therapy has been helpful. The Cotard delusion remains a rare neuropsychiatric condition, although it's associated with a broad spectrum of medical diseases. Physically, as you can imagine, it can be incredibly disabling, and in rare cases, fatal, as we saw with Mademoiselle X. But there is a silver lining. 21st century advances in the treatment of neuropsychiatric disease are far more effective than what was available to Jules Cotard in the mid-19th century. In August of 1889, not even 50 years old, Cotard would pass away. Earlier that month, his daughter contracted diphtheria. Many of you probably don't even know what that is anymore because we vaccinate against it nowadays. In most cases, it can present as an upper respiratory infection, manifesting with an exudative cough, and it can even cause cardiac and neurologic complications as well. It's a highly contagious illness. So, in tending to his daughter, not leaving her bedside for 15 consecutive days, Cotard fell ill with the disease. Five days later, a plug of mucus obstructed his airway, and despite attempts at a surgical tracheostomy, and in God only knows how much pain, he died on August 19, 1889, nine years after his original publication on the Delir Denegations. Perhaps more distressing than his untimely death, Cotard had spent the last several years summarizing his views on neurology and philosophy in a major book, a book that was never to be found. His legacy is left in the manuscripts he was able to publish and in the writings of his contemporaries. Without a doubt, we owe much of our understanding of neurology and psychiatry to physicians like Jules Cotard. Who knows how much we may have lost in his missing manuscript and his untimely death. And despite his major discoveries, he never proclaimed that he was the first to describe any of these relationships. Not once. Like Isaac Newton, who once said, If I've seen so far, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Cotard described much of his success to those who came before him. To mentors like Charcot and Vulpian. To friends and philosophers like Comte. But it was Cotard who put in the hard work, and he made the connections. It was Cotard who performed the careful autopsies after treating patients throughout the day. Cotard who meticulously studied the clinical and pathological characteristics of his patients, and thoroughly documented those observations. And he's worthy of far more recognition for his efforts and his accomplishments than he's received by historians of neurology. That's all we got for you this week on Brainwaves. Just a reminder, if you're taking your neurology board exam this year and you need some way to help you study, you could be accessing great video and audio lectures through the Penn Neurology Board Review course right now. Just go to PennNeuroBoard2018.com and sign up. It may seem pricey, but you can get $150 off if you sign up using our promo code WAVES2018. That's WAVES in all caps. All right, that's it. The Brainwaves podcast is produced out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jim Siegler, senior producer. Music for this week's show is courtesy of Andrew Sacco, Damiano Baldoni, and Raphael Archangel. For more information, you can find us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or Facebook at facebook.com slash brainwavespodcast. 
For additional information on Jules Cotard, please refer to our blog at brainwaves.me. I'm Jim Sigler, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.